Friends, if there's one day that we discuss pain and challenge and difficulty, this is it. And so the title of The Upside of Pain is a perfect description of how we need to tackle this one day of tragedy, of mourning, of difficulty that our people face every single year and have done for the past 1,955 years. You know, the word for pain in Hebrew, one of the ways to describe it is tsar. Tsar is pain. But the word tsar is related to another Hebrew word, which is tsiur, which is to form, to create something. And the reason the rabbis say is because when someone is in pain, when you're in challenge and difficulty, you have the ability to to form yourself into a new being. That is the upside, my friend, friends, that comes with the idea of pain, of difficulty, of challenge. Take your tsar, don't let it break you, become nishbar, but create yourself into something brand new. That is an annual opportunity that we have as the Jewish people. There's a book, which is not so famous, but it was written by a grandson of Rashi. His name was Rabbeinu Tam, one of the Tosfists. And this book is called the Sefer Hayashar. And in the ninth chapter, the Perak Chi, he asked the following fascinating question, which I've asked many times, and I'm sure you've asked yourself this question. How do you know if you're doing well spiritually? It's a great question. I mean, you know if you're doing well financially, a lot of money in your pocket. You know if you're doing well academically, getting good grades. So how do you know if you're doing well and Hashem loves you? And he gives a number of answers. They're fa- a list, actually, fascinating list of things you can look through in your life. For example, he says, if you see yourself turning from a not good person to a good person, that means Hashem has helped you to find the right path, turned your heart of stone, he says, into flesh and blood. That, he says, is a sign that Hashem is happy with you. You turned your life around. He says, if you're going to do a avira, a sin, and you're prevented by factors outside of yourself from doing that avira, you're on your way to the McDonald's to get a burger, and as you're about to walk in, you see Rabbi Fahi, you're like, whoa, I, I can't go in there now, can I? The rabbi's here. And he's like, hey, how you doing? And you're like, yeah, I'm doing okay. Hungry? Uh, yeah. Come with me. There's a great new kosher restaurant just opened. Hashem loves you. He saves you. And then he says, if you find yourself in pain, if you find yourself with challenges, that is the clearest expression that Hashem loves you. It's unbelievable. It's antithetical to what we're taught. If you're in pain, get rid of the pain. It's not a good thing. Be pain-free. You know, I have a, my chavruta and very good friend is an anesthesiologist. He's Jewish, by the way, as you can guess. And we were talking, and I said, tell me about the different types of pain relief that exist in the world today. So he said, what do you mean? He goes, you're an anesthesiologist. What do you have? What can you get me? And he says, we have general anesthetic that knocks you out. And then we have local anesthetic that focuses in on a particular pain you're having your toe operated on. And you give a local anesthetic, and it stops the, I don't know, the receptors, whatever it is, traveling up the leg, up the spine, all the way to the brain. That's a local anesthetic. It blocks it completely. It just doesn't get through. And then he says, there's another type, though, he says, that's called morphine. And morphine is a very, very strong and potent drug. But it works very differently to a local anesthetic. See, a local anesthetic will prevent the pain getting through to your brain. It blocks it. But morphine allows the pain to get through and reach your brain, but it tells you it's not painful. You see the difference? See, morphine will not block the pain. It says you're going to feel the pain, but it's not going to be painful. And then it occurred to me while he was saying this to me, that we have the ability to bring spiritual, emotional morphine into our lives. I can feel the pain. I don't want to block it out with drugs. I can feel it. But I have the ability to translate it and say that it's not painful. That's our decision. That is something we can work on. And yet on Tisha B'Av, we're in pain. There's a lot of tragedy in the world, a lot of division. Just a look at the news. The Jewish people are divided clearly. It's terrible to see. And yet on Tisha B'Av, we figure this out. 
We think about it, but we have to live it as well. There's a story about Napoleon. Napoleon was on the run at one point in his life from the Russian army. And he had to escape. And as the story goes, he found the house of a Jewish man. And the Jewish man welcomed him in and said, I'll take care of you. I'm going to hide you in my house. And so Napoleon was hidden under many, many blankets and mattresses. That's how this Jewish man decided he was going to help Napoleon. And the Russians came in, and they said, is Napoleon in the house? And he's like, I don't know. And they looked through, and they saw this big pile of mattresses, and they started to pull the blankets off, and the other mattresses, they thought, ah, there's no one here, and they left. After they left, the Jewish man held Napoleon out and said, tell me, while they were searching through these blankets and mattresses, were you scared? And Napoleon said, how dare you? How dare you question the great Napoleon if I was scared? Who do you think you are? Guards, take this Jew and take him to the gallows. And they grabbed the Jew and he didn't know what was going on. He said, I don't understand. I was helping to save his life. And they dragged to the gallows. And Napoleon said, put the noose on his neck. And they lowered the rope around him. And they tightened it. And as they were about to open the trap door, Napoleon said, stop. He walked over to the man. He took the noose off his neck and he said, now you know how I felt. Had I told you I was scared and I was in pain, you would never have believed me. But now, now you've been through the experience, now you can feel what I went through. That's how scared I was. The exact feeling you have now. This is what we need to do. On Tisha B'Av, it's not about feeling our own pain. The pain we're in by not eating or drinking or greeting or showering or brushing our teeth, which for me is an absolute terrible thing. All of that is there to help us feel the pain of other people. I just got back a few days ago with a group from Auschwitz. I've been there five, six times. I was with people who've never been there before. It's never easy to visit Germany or Poland. This is what I did. And we went to Auschwitz and Majdanek. Majdanek is a whole different disease. We'll leave that aside for now. But in Auschwitz, you may have seen there's exhibits. And these are real life mounds of hair that they shave the women from to use this hair to stuff pillows and to... And there are pots and pans, hundreds and thousands of them, which are blue and red because the people who went to Auschwitz really thought they'd be cooking meat and milk. And so you see a mound of red and blue pots and pans. And there are suitcases with names on. These Jewish people actually thought they'd be going on a, a short trip before being relocated somewhere else in Europe. But to me, that wasn't the worst. To me, and it gets me every single time, with the shoes, behind the glass, 100,000 shoes. That's what they told us. Small shoes, big shoes, men's shoes, women's shoes, children. And as I was walking through, my wife was with us. And she said, look, Lawrence, there's a beautiful pair of red shoes, a small child who just probably bought them recently in good condition for a bat mitzvah, a party for school, for Shabbat, Chagim. She's gone, the shoes are there. And I was walking past this 100,000 shoes, and if I was able to, I would have just taken my shoes off and throw them in with the rest. Instead of Tisha B'Av, we don't wear shoes. That's how we connect. That's how we feel the pain that people are going through. There's a, uh, a very cute story. I thought it wasn't real, but it is actually a true story about a great rabbi called Rabbi Isaac Harif. A great scholar in his day. And he was very, very wealthy as well, as well as being a tremendous Talmud Chacham. And he wanted to find a good yeshiva boy for his daughter. I may have told the story before, I apologize, but the ending's a little bit different now. So he went to the top, top yeshiva. And he said to the Rosh Yeshiva, said, look, I want to find a boy, a bachor for my daughter, for her to meet and maybe marry. 
do me a favor. Let me pose a question. And whoever gets the question right will have the sort of potentially marrying my daughter if they agree. And he said, no problem. And so Rabbi Isaac Harif created the most difficult, challenging question from the Gemara, Rishonim, Acharonim. The whole thing was so convoluted. And he stood at the front of the yeshiva and he asked this question. And all the boys were like, woohoo, good chance to win ourselves a great father-in-law and maybe a nice girl too. And they came forward with the answer to this question. And the first boy came and he said, I'm sorry, that's not the right question. Next. And the next bachor came. He said, that's not the right answer to the question. Next. Boy after boy, bachor after bachor, each one of them could not get this very, very difficult Talmudic question correctly. Eventually, at the back, there's a little young man, 18, 19 years old, not the greatest scholar in the yeshiva, which is why he was last. And he came forward. And Recharif posed this question and said, so, do you know the answer to the question? And the boy said, yeah, I think I do. And he gave him the answer. And Recharif said, no, that's wrong. <laughs> that's not the answer to the question. Recharif packed up his books and he went out and he went on to his coach where his horses were waiting and he started to ride off. And suddenly he heard from behind him, wait, wait. And he turned around, there was this little young boy, the last kid, and he's running, running, running. And all the steam is, and sand is coming off his shoes and he's running, running, running with his sit, sit, flying. And Recharif stopped the horses and the caravan. He said, yes, do you think you know the answer to the question? And the boy said, no, I don't have the answer to the question. You know that. But I didn't want to leave without telling me what the answer to the question actually is. And as the story goes, Rabbi Kharif said, you can marry my daughter. The fact you wanted to know. Because perhaps the point of a test is to demonstrate that you want to know the answer. You may not have the power to do it. You may even fail the test. But maybe the test came in the first place as a way for you to find something in yourself that would allow you to want to know what the answer is. We are being tested today. I don't know the answer. I don't know why we are still in Galut. I have some ideas, but I don't know for sure. But by just turning up, going through the motions, no eating, no sleeping, sitting on the floor for the first half of the day, no brushing teeth, no showering, all of this, at least I'm in it to try to possibly find an answer to this 2,000 year old question I recently went through I, I don't usually talk about these kind of things but it's Tisha B'Av I recently went through a negotiation I was part of it there is a, a woman that we're very close to my wife is and she's going through a divorce and there's been arguments for the past three to four years over money. Obviously, there's money involved over here. It's going backwards and forwards. Eventually, got to the point where we said we need to sit down in a room together. And I was there with my wife and this woman and her soon-to-be ex-husband and two rabbanim. And all I can say is it was very, very awkward. Dare I say it, painful. Backwards and forwards, questions, details, numbers, it's not something I recommend you do, but it's a tremendous mitzvah if you're able to bring some form of peshara, compromise, to the situation. I mentioned this story because something happened during this story. We were sitting there and things were getting, dare I say it, very ugly and very painful. And this happened within the past three weeks. Probably shouldn't have met during this time, maybe. And the rabbi who was there as the mediator between the two sides, stops the proceedings as they were getting very uncomfortable and very heated and very argumentative. And he banged his hand down and said, wait one second, I need to go get some ammunition. And I looked at my wife, I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy's got some, he's packing some heat. He's going to bring a gun in here. I had no idea what this man was going to do. And he's a very sweet, able rabbi, so I knew something was up. 
and he walked off. And he came, this actually was taking place in his house. And he came back with a chumash and a tehillim. And he said, my ammunition is now with me. Now we continue. And I tell you something, it was a genius move. Because as soon as he did this, it kind of diffused the situation. The air that was stifling in the room just kind of released and things calmed down because Torah, my friends, and Tehillim is the way for us to bring shalom into this world. And Talmud Chachamim, great scholars like this man, we're told, have the ability to bring shalom into this world. And that's what he did. It was a genius move. And for the rest of the meeting, it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't like it was before. Suddenly, the whole situation turned around. When you bring Torah, not politics, and not money, but pure Torah, pure tefillah, into the situation, suddenly, whether you like it or not, shalom is going to prevail. I must tell you a story. I wasn't going to tell it, but I mentioned last night in the podcast that Rabbi Fahi so beautifully wrote, I have to mention the story. <laughs> Although for me, it's a pretty funny story. But it's on the same topic. It's just some context, first of all. We'd been going through the concentration camps, and it was a very, very tense, intense time, as you can imagine. And we spent Shabbat in Prague, which is a beautiful city. My wife and the group. And we were sitting down having lunch. It's a kosher hotel in Prague. And we're sitting down. Last Shabbat, having Shabbat lunch, singing Divrei Torah, stories about the week. You know, it was an intense week. We wanted to diffuse. There were other families in the hotel. And one of the men who was part of the other families got into a dispute with the mashkiach of the restaurant that was in the hotel. And it started to get heated and get more heated, and more angry, and more angry. And they were standing right behind me, so we're sitting at a table. My wife's in front of me. She has a full view of this. They're right behind me. And now they're like arguing and shouting at each other, and it was going on too long. And I was thinking to myself, should I say something? Should I not say something? And you know that feeling of two people arguing, and everyone else just gets very, very silent. Think, what should we do? I was about to get up and be like, come on, guys. I'm trying to have some chicken over here. Come on, get over it. But I didn't get a chance to do that. Because immediately, without exaggeration, my wife, out of the blue, pops up out of her chair, stands up, and puts her hands up in the air and says, Baruch Hashem, somebody is being insulted. Please give me a bracha. I need to marry off a couple of daughters. I got a friend who's going through a divorce. I need a bracha. And... The entire restaurant, including me, just looks so... What? Please, don't waste the opportunity. If you're arguing and someone's been insulted, please bring them forth and give me a bracha. I'd mentioned the last time I spoke over here, but she actually did it. And I burst out laughing. I just could not control myself. I was... I just, the whole scenario was so absurd. And these two guys just turned around to my wife and said, bracha, 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 and they went their separate ways. <laughs> it worked. It actually worked. So we were trying to figure out last night, what about this situation? What fixed it? What exactly was going on? I have my theory. When you bring shalom into the situation, into the scenario, and you talk about it, and you empower people with the ability to give a bracha at their most worst time when they're losing their temper, they feel empowered and they realize, wow, what am I doing? Am I crazy? I'm shouting and screaming over the food. The salad wasn't the right type of salad and I wasn't happy with the service. That's what I'm talking about. And she turned around and said, you can give a bracha. You have the power to give a blessing. Do you know who you are? You're a descendant of Avram Avinu. Because Hashem says to Avram Avinu, I, says Hashem, have the ability to give brachot, but I give that power now to you and your descendants. You are the people who can bring bracha to this world. Because if you don't bring bracha, chas 
the opposite. The opposite will be true. I don't know if people realize the power that they have to bring shalom and turn pain into simcha. We don't realize. I must go back to the journey. I hope you don't mind, but it's in my head. And I posted this on social media as well. We were flying back, and we had to take a short flight from Warsaw to Frankfurt and then back to, to New York. So we're sitting on the plane, and my wife's sitting next to me, and suddenly I get a nudge from my wife. She gives me the elbow. She says, look, 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 look. I'm like, what am I looking at? And she points at a man sitting next to me. And I see that this man has Hebrew on his arm, which, as a rabbi, is a gift. You know what I'm saying? If you need a conversation starter, you look for Hebrew on someone's arm. And you can see the photo if you want. On his arm was written the word, Emunah. Emunah in Hebrew. Lashon Kodesh on his arm. And his other arm, a big mug in David. Now, I see a lot of tattoos. Because nowadays, unfortunately, it's the passport to being human. Right? Everyone needs to have a tattoo of something. But I had to strap a conversation. And I wasn't even sure that it was Jewish. So I said, oh, that's a nice tattoo on your arm. Do you know what it says? And he looks at me like I'm an idiot and says, yeah, it means faith. And I was like, okay, good. <laughs> We're off to a good start. I said, do you mind me asking you? By the way, if people have tattoos, they want to show them off. You can ask them about them, right? You don't have a tattoo for no one to see. The tattoo is there for everyone to look at. And I said, why do you have the word emunah on your arm? And he says, because my parents were Holocaust survivors. They had numbers on their arm. And I wanted to put emunah, faith, on my arm in the same place they had their numbers. And I brought my son here for the first time, he said, a young boy at a college. I've actually connected him to the local rabbi. And he was with him, and we're taking him around. I want to show him what... And I said, so, but why did you choose this? What was the... And he says, let me tell you a quick story. By the way, on airplanes, you get into stories you don't get anywhere else. Suddenly you get to talk to people you don't normally get a chance to have a conversation with. And it was a good one half hour flight, which, by the way, arrived late. We missed our connecting flight. I had to spend another night in Frankfurt. Another story, not for now. So I said, what's the story? He says, let me tell you something. I grew up in Cleveland. I was a very, very religious boy from a religious family. But I always hated going to Bet Knesset at the synagogue, and I hated going to yeshiva, and it just didn't interest me, and whenever I could cut school, I cut school, and to this day, I cannot even set foot in a synagogue, and so I had to run away from that, and I went to LA, and he became a successful entertainment lawyer. He's connected to Spielberg, he's leaning of all these famous people in LA. I was impressed. And he said, I left, I went so far. And then I started to meet people in LA who were good, kind, teachers and rabbis and spiritual leaders. And I said, you know what? There's something to this. There's something I can connect to over here. You know, there's a famous, I don't know if it's true, it's a mashallah, I don't know what it is, but it could be a time when one day we go to the next world and Hashem says, you had a major impact on so many people during your life. And they give you a list of all the people you impacted during your life. And then he says, there's even this guy from Texas, from L.A., from China. I'm like, what? I didn't know this person from L.A. or Texas or China. He goes, no, you didn't know them. But once when you were praying in the hotel, once you were in the synagogue, once you were in the supermarket, they saw you. They saw how frustrated you could have been and you acted in a nice way. You made a kid of Shashem. They changed their life because of you and you don't even know who they are, and yet you get credit for their change. And that's what happened to this man. He said, I just saw great people, and I learned from them, and I watched how they act, and I said, I need to turn things around. And he became connected to Torah Mitzvot one more time. It's always there. You know, in the parasha, we're going to talk about the Shema. The Shema, of course, the famous beautiful tefillah. We say twice a day. And I read something beautiful over here. That the word Shema is an acronym, Rosh Tevot, right? For Shachrit, Mincha, Arvit, Shin, Mem, 
Ayin. And it's also a backwards acronym, Rosh Tevot, for Ol Malchut Shemayim. We ask God to put his heavenly yoke and kingdom upon us. We accept upon ourselves God's kingship upon us. Very beautiful. But I read somewhere something unbelievable. And I thought about this, but it was proven to me. That actually the words have sounds. You've got a shin and a mem and an ayin. Shin, mem, ayin. That's a sh and a m and a. So when you close your eyes for those couple of seconds every single day, which is an opportunity for introspection. And by the way, as a side point, whatever you think of, the Bel Shem Tov says this, whatever you think of while he's saying the Shema is what you need to work on. If there's something that pops into your head, and now I've told you, you're going to be aware of it, that pops into your head when he's saying the first line of the Shema, the Baal Shem Tov says that something needs to be worked on. If an inappropriate image comes in, that's what you need to take out. It actually says by saying the Shema, you're taking it out. Just like when a non-kosher pot brings in non-kosher food, how do you take out the gliot? How do you take out the particles inside? You heat it, right? Either through fire or through boiling water, and the bad stuff comes out. He says the same thing with the Shema. When you say the Shema, you're cooking yourself, as it were. And the bad stuff that comes in is actually going out. So you're actually seeing the bad thoughts and ideas leave you, not come in. Which is a relief for many, many people. And so Shema, Shin, Mem, Ayin. First of all, you have to shh, quiet in your mind. Then you've got to think. That's the mmm. And then finally, you figure out what you're meant to do. Ah. That's what it says. Shin, Mem, Ayin, Shema. What a different way of understanding. Even the sounds within our traditions have tremendous power. You know, there's a... Um, it's a bit of a joke, but there's something to it, I believe, connected to this concept. A man goes into a clinic and says, you know, I think my wife is going deaf. I need a hearing aid. He says, well, if we give her a hearing aid, check to make sure her hearing is really bad. He goes, what should I do? He says, make her face the wall and ask her a question from 10 feet away. If she can't answer, go five feet closer. If she can't answer, go three feet. And we'll figure out how bad her hearing problem actually is. And so the man does it. He says, honey, I want to test you. Face the wall. He stands 10 feet away. He says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. He's like, not good. He goes five feet closer. He says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. He's like, oh my goodness. This is really not good. He goes even closer. He's now one foot behind her. He says, honey, what's for dinner? And she turns around and says, I told you three times it's chicken and potatoes. We're so quick, so quick to look at other people and find fault in them. But the truth is, my friends, Tisha B'Av is about finding the fault in ourselves. That's what we need to do. You know, there's many exiles that are happening in the world right now. The Ukrainians are being exiled from Russia. Everyone's being exiled. Go to Africa, people are being exiled, kicked out of their countries. The one makes our exile from Eretz Yisrael. What makes our galut from Yerushalayim so bad that we're still figuring out 2,000 years later. The difference is, my friends, that when they try to figure it out, they try to figure out the effect of the exile. We, the Jewish people, we want to find the cause. What is the cause? What led to this situation? And the rabbis even have an answer. And they say, it's chinam. There was a baseless hatred, they say, between each other. It, can any hatred be baseless? Isn't every hatred based on something? I think, my friend, the reason is it's baseless when there is no good reason. Sometimes there is a good reason. Sometimes someone says something bad, you does something bad, you steals money. That's an understandable reason. But sometimes I just don't like the way she looks. I don't know why she has that and I don't. I don't know the fact that he drives that car and I don't. It becomes baseless not based on anything of quality or value. I hear a dispute. It's understandable. Then find a peshara. And yet we don't. We'll let the whole thing go. I'll finish with one last Gemara about a man called Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi 
was walking through the marketplace and he saw Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet. Big opportunity to ask him a question because he had died many years before. So obviously having this apparition in front of him was a big schut. And he said, when is Mashiach coming? And Eliyahu said, go ask him yourself. What? Well, where is he? He's in Rome, at the gates of Rome. You go, you find him, and you ask him. Wow, what an opportunity. Jehovah Shuman Levi goes, and he sees Mashiach there, who, by the way, was doing chesed with poor, ill people. It's a side point. That's what he was doing. They had sarat, they had leprosy, and he was helping them out. He himself was affected by it, but we'll leave that aside. It's a much bigger discussion, much deeper discussion, not for now. And he said, Time Mashiach, when are you coming? And he says, First of all, we greet each other. Bar Levi, nice to see you. Son of Levi, Roshua ben Levi. And he says, I'm coming today. Oh, can you imagine? You meet the real Mashiach, and he's coming today. And so he went all the way home, and he sees the Alan Navi again in the marketplace. And he says, So you met him? He goes, Yeah. And he goes, How was he? He says, He's a liar. He goes, did you just call Mashiach a liar? He goes, I did. He said, he's coming today and he's still not here. And Yahweh obviously said, you misunderstood the word today. You understood the word today literally as today. But in Hebrew, the word is hayom. And the word hayom doesn't always mean today. It can mean the day. Or what's the day? The day you figure out how to treat each other well. When you can figure out on that day that we actually pull back from revenge, from grudges, from jealousy, from and everything else that we hear about all the time, when you can work on that, that becomes the day. It's in our hands. We have the ability through introspection, like the man with the wife that he thought was deaf, he was actually deaf himself. Like Napoleon to the man himself, you've got to feel the pain. Like those two people arguing in a restaurant over nonsense. If you can one second allow the Torah to penetrate your heart, allow the shalom to enter into your home, all pain will cease to exist. And that will become the day of redemption for our people. Friends, we're getting very, very close. It can't get much worse, I like to think, before the division eventually becomes absolute unity. May Hashem bless us all with continued success and barachot. May this be the last Tisha B'Av and Chos next year. God willing, I'll be speaking in Yerushalayim. You're all invited.